Welcome to Celerity Technology. In this episode, we'll be talking about RGB 101. What exactly is RGB? I'm guessing that most of you guys already know that RGB stands for red, green, blue, but I'm not sure that most of people understand what significance those colors play in lighting. So what it is, is RGB is actually the primary additive color. So we have red, green, and blue, and those colors you can mix and match to get basically any color that you want to get, a total of 16.7 million different variations. These primary additive colors are different from the colors you learned at, when you're in school, which are red, blue, and yellow. These are quite different. These are subtractive colors. These usually refer to pigments, inks, crayons, and if you mix all these together, you kind of get a darker color. If you mix these together, you're going to get a light color. These actually differ from this. This LED right here has all three of these different diodes inside of it and as you notice this has only this only has four pins while you see six different ones coming out of this because this LED uses a common anode we can't adjust the voltage to adjust the brightness of the LED so what we have to do is use pulse width modulation similar to what people are familiar with in fans slightly di it's a bit different but the same concept you alter the pulse width of each cathode to to vary the brightness of each LED and that's how we mix and match the different colors together and by doing that we can really get any variation of color that we're looking for at a total of about 16.7 million different combinations. For LED lighting like this we have 24 bit color we have 8 bit for each of the red green and blue and there's a couple different ways we can set this in software for example we have decimal which is, has a range of 256 uh, variations between each um, diode. You have 0, which is off, and 255, which is the max brightness. Then you, actually, then you also have hexadecimal. Hexadecimal is a range of uh, numbers and letters from A to F, 0 to 9, mixed together. It's a little confusing, and we might touch upon that some other time. But um, in hexadecimal, we, when you see FF, 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 that means either color is going to be white. If you see 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, that means none of the LEDs will be on. Decimal is easier and that's what we're going to focus more on. So, um, yes, I just said more on. For example, if we set red and green to both 255 but blue to 0, we'll get a yellow. If we set uh, red and blue uh, at 255 each and then green to 0, we get more of a magenta. So by adjusting these numbers allows us to really adjust the, not only the brightness, but what color we get. What decimal and hexadecimal allows us to do is it allows us to set the numbers and colors for everything across various softwares because you're not going to have one software usually that controls all your LEDs. Um, especially if you're into a lot of RGB devices, you're going to find that, well, I can have this software for this stuff, but this software only works for that stuff. So um, using hexadecimal or decimal allows you to kind of unify the color and match them via that way. It might not always be perfect, but it's the closest way you can do it. It's better than using like the color wheel to try to do that. Um, when it comes to LED lighting, there's a lot of confusion out there. You have your common analog 12 volt RGB strips like the one up here. And then you have your digital RGB strips, the ones that people refer to as, you know, unicorn vomit or whatnot. And the significance between these two is quite a bit. In the industry, it's pretty common for the analog RGB strips to use a 12-volt header. Digital primarily use a 5-volt. Gigabyte does have a jumper that allows you to switch between 5 and 12, but pretty much most of the LEDs I see out there for digital are, are going to be 5-volt. This can be pretty significant because you do not want to plug an analog into a digital header and a digital header into an analog. You don't want to mix and match. They won't work. The big difference between these is the analog, as I say, is no different than this diode. You have the same number of conductors. You have a common anode and a red, green, and blue cathode. And that's the same thing with the strips that you see right here. And as I said earlier, it uses pulse width modulation on the low side, which is the negative of each cathode, to control the brightness and vary the color. So what the digital LEDs is, they actually take it one step farther. They actually embed a little microchip or integrated circuit into each one of the LEDs to allow you to change and shift the colors independently of the LED surrounding it. 
So with the analog, you'll have one controller and all the lights will match. You can change the colors, but whatever color you set it to, all the LEDs will be the same. Digital, on the other hand, you can get this huge variation because the integrated chip inside of each one of these LEDs is actually sending in a separate its own pulse width modulation signal to each of the LEDs and you have a main controller that then powers and sends the data through through this strip and then it actually allows you to set these LEDs for separate colors and I think that's pretty ingenious and I like the variation that you can get I mean the rainbow is this default pattern because I don't have this currently connected to anything but it's also a good display of you know the variation and difference between these two strips one advantage about the 12 volt analog is the connections are fairly standard. I mean, this is a, a slightly older technology, so it's been around longer, and the pin spacing allows you to virtually plug it into any motherboard. They also use the 12, they also use 12 volt GRB, it's not RGB, it's GRB on these actual items. That's how the pins are laid out, and it's fairly consistent between the motherboards. The digital RGB strips, on the other hand, are. Um, not as standard unfortunately. You have different connectors and different pinouts on motherboards. For example, Gigabyte has uh, power data ground. Uh, ASUS and also MSI uses a puts a space between the the ground and the data so you can have a blank fourth pin in the middle of that. So there isn't as many standards and the connectors they come in all sorts. You have some connectors which come in a four pin Fan standard connector, which I think is a bad idea, especially if you're playing with a 5 volt device that somebody I could easily see plugging it into a, a 12 volt header, which would fry it. Um, my favorite connector is actually Corsair's because it uses a really old connector that I haven't seen since CD ROM drives. Um, it's a latch connector with a key in it, so you can't flip it the wrong way. It's fairly idiot proof and it's a non-proprietary connector, so it'd be nice if the industry as a whole moves to it that way. There's less people saying, like, why doesn't my ships work? I plugged it into the um, motherboard header, and it doesn't work. If you plugged it into an analog, you might have fried it with a 12 volt. So, On some MSI motherboards, they actually do have a J Corsair header, which can be used for you know any digital device, but it's nice to see something like that because it's keyed and it's... Uh, latch so it doesn't fall apart. Even the analog strips I have issues with disconnecting but I usually wrap a little bit of um, electrical tape to stop them from falling apart. Um, that helps a lot when you're building, we're doing wire management and then you're like okay this, this light's not on or that's not lights on but I do like the latch connector, I like, do like the key and I think that's a brilliant idea and I'd like to see the industry in a general move to that. There are many different ways to control lighting on your computer whether you have a manual controller that's on your case, uh, a RF controller that used to change the color like this or if you have software and software I think is the best way of doing it because that gives you the most customization allows you to automate switching our profiles and whatnot and the software in general in the industry is actually fairly in its infancy I find software a lot better than the manual way because you can automate a lot of things you can mix more easily mix and match your different devices and um, I know there's IQ there, by Corsair, there's Asus Aura, um, Gigabyte Fusion, um, a lot of different tools out there. Um, my favorite so far out of all the ones I looked is um, IQ. And IQ is based upon a very mature RGB software that's used for controlling keyboards, which is called Q. In early June 2018, Corsair released IQ and I've been playing with it even when it was in beta and I thought it was a very powerful tool and I really enjoyed it. You can actually you set up different profiles to start when you're launching different games. You can also stack different effects. So you get a lot of different variation, a lot of control that I really don't see within a lot of the other tools. As a matter of fact, I have a Gigabyte motherboard and I really wasn't too pleased um, with some of the controls on it because I was used to Q before work. It set you know this profile to start on my keyboard when I launched this game and switch it color to that when I played this other game and I really like that so I actually wrote a open source um, tool to actually to control the motherboard's lighting just as I do on my keyboard and whatnot so I thought that was pretty cool and if anybody's interested I'll put a link below um, I really appreciate you guys um, taking the time to watch this video I'm sure people will have a lot of questions. Um, feel free to subscribe. It makes me feel better about myself, at least. And I'd um, like to thank my daughter for her crowns. That's our official sponsor today, I guess. Thank you.